Okay. Hi. Uh, I already feel so uncomfortable. Okay. Um, welcome. My name is Kamikaze Jones, and I'm here to first explain some things because uh, I've decided to do a little uh, experiment. Let's just say that. Mm. I decided to record a thing that I would compare to a podcast, maybe. It's just gonna be me talking to myself, which is something that I have been already doing <laughs> quite frequently for the past five or six years. And now I'm just putting a camera in front of myself and recording that. Mm, yeah. So, so, long story short, I'm kind of bored. Uh, and I'm really thirsty for, for some nice juicy convo with, with some random strangers online, but not in like this form, in, in this way and fashion that, you know, is usually seen on Twitter and all of those fucking other social media platforms where people just bicker with each other for no good reason, just to stir up drama and shit. I just wanted to converse with people on, on matters that I am passionate about. And, um, and just have fun, you know? So, so <laughs> I guess the easiest way to present this is uh, to just kind of start this whole thing. Uh, and this is what we're going to do in a, in a moment. I'll just explain some basic uh, first few rules, because why not, right? <laughs> this is so fucking bad. It's gonna be so cringy to listen to later on. Never mind. Um, yeah, so, so essentially what I want to start is, again, like this kind of a podcast situation, except with a conversation afterwards, you know? I could technically do this with a friend and just record myself having a conversation with, with a person that I know, but again, as I have said, I kind of want to have a, a, a conversation with people that I don't know. I kind of want to expand my horizons a little bit and then seek out uh, opinions, uh, ideas, beliefs from, from people outside of my, let's just say, comfort zone, right? I kind of just want to have a conversation with people mm, that I also wouldn't normally have with, with people that I know. Mm. And this is what I'm gonna do. So essentially, I'm going to present a topic to you, uh, you know, something that, again, I am passionate about, uh, usually uh, in the fields of either psychology or philosophy, because these are the things that I'm passionate about. And then after I, I very poorly, <laughs> but to the best of my ability, present a, a specific view or a specific point, a specific idea that have caught my attention, that, that I am passionate about, uh, and kind of show my own stance on it, I would like you people to then, uh, in the comments or anywhere else, just do the same, you know, just, just, you know, have a conversation with me. I'll try to then read for those comments, uh, those one, one or two comments that aren't going to be first or your mama, Mm, or or the infamous KYS, mm, KBG. <laughs> Jesus, I'm looking into the camera. Uh, yeah, I, I I'll try to then read for those comments and just try to respond to them. Try to maintain a, a discussion with all of you as many as I can. Uh, you know, I may not respond right off the bat. It may take it, it might take weeks or. or uh, I don't know, days, but, but I'll try to respond whenever I can and whenever I, I, I feel like I can respond uh, appropriately. Uh, but until then, let's just see if this disaster of a video can even go somewhere, you know? The nifty little thing is that I can see how much time I'm <laughs> using on this. Right now it's like four minutes, so uh, that's fine. I'm planning to like do these for like 20 uh, minutes, somewhere around that number. But yeah, the topic that I was going to talk about today was going to be... Uh, I, I was thinking that 
you know, because I want to start this thing off, and if this is going to be something that I'm going to do more frequently, which is, you know, the reason why I'm recording this thing uh, <laughs> from the very beginning, uh, otherwise I would just be talking to myself normally and just discussing this in the uh, privacy of, of my own little solitude. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was thinking that a good way to start this would be to either present... Uh, you know, something chronologically and start off with some classes like Plato or Aristotle uh, or I could jump into the things that I am uh, passionate, passionate about myself um, uh, I mainly, let's just say, specialize in terms of like what I like, what I'm interested in, what I research the most thoroughly uh, which is still not all that thorough, but I do my best uh, yeah uh, I specialize mostly in ontology, anthropology, uh, anth anthropology, I'm sorry, that was a weird uh, pronunciation there. And also um, metaphysics. Uh, and yeah, I, I, <laughs> and I'd say that's that. Uh, however, recently I have been discussing in my class the curious case of one John Stuart Mill and his views on liberty. And I have seen some videos, some TEDx talks um, on uh, various different um, uh, scenarios, various different uh, life stories of people. And that caught my attention and I just thought that since this is a, a, a topic that is fresh on my mind and this is something that I uh, am still freshly impassioned about it, let's just say that, I, I thought that I would just present that case. And, you know, without further ado, let's just jump into it, as, as <laughs> a certain someone would say. Mm, yeah, this is already going off to, <laughs> to a great start. Uh, yeah. So, uh, the reason why I'm talking about John Stuart Mill and those three TED, uh, TEDx talks, because we are going to mention the three, uh, at least I hope so, uh, is because I um, saw a bit of a correlation there. And I thought, like, uh, what would be a better thing to talk about, to kind of like rile up and then encourage people to have a conversation, than starting off with, like, uh, political philosophy Be because I'm not a huge fan of political philosophy but it is a good conversation starter it's, it's something that a lot of people can easily engage with in without having much knowledge and it is something that you know because politics is such a uh, I don't want to say biased but but definitely uh, a, a, a um, field that, that thrives on, on debate and discussion then you know people are very uh, prone to, to discuss things whenever they're like of political uh, matter I guess <laughs> yeah uh, so let, let's just start with uh, saying like what John Stuart Mill represents the source material for John Stuart Mill that I'm going to refer to which I believe is kind of like John Stuart Mill in, in a nutshell at least the most essential parts that uh, of, of his philosophy and, and views that uh, you know, are the, I would say, um, uh, like, like this signature of, of, uh, of John Stuart Mill. This is what he is mostly associated with. Yeah, the, the book that I'm talking about is On Liberty. Um, the concepts that I uh, am going to mostly talk about are the concepts of social liberty, individual liberty, mm, the conflict between an individual and the oppressing state, or however the fuck you want to <laughs> refer to this, uh, and um, the issue of, of freedom of speech, which isn't necessarily part of uh, Mill's, uh, you know, treatise per se. It's not, it's not like he uh, deliberately and directly references freedom of speech, but it is something that derives from his political views, and I think that's something that is worthy of, of talking about and acknowledging here. So, um, John Stuart Mill, 
is considered the the classic of, of uh, liberalism, right? He's he's the guy who uh, most people when when they will talk to you about liberalism and they're not just a bunch of screeching uh, kids online are going to tell you like yeah if you want to consider yourself a liberal you gotta start with John Stuart Mill and I'd say that for for anyone who wants to get into a political debate in general because you want to start with the classics of both sides you know you want to start with with the classics of the right and the classics of the left to even know uh, with who <laughs> with whom you are fighting knowing the roots of your enemy or you know, just just a uh, a person uh, that you are debating with, which is something that we will move to in just a moment, is important. So yeah, Mill is uh, the classic of uh, liberalism. He is the guy who started the whole uh, talk on issues of of liberty. Uh, in the sense that I would say is quite relevant to this day. Uh, in the sense of an individual uh, uh, fighting or at the very least expecting uh, to have a place for themselves, for their own privacy, for their own um, individual system of beliefs in a political system, in a community, in a society. Um, society <laughs> yeah long story short uh, what mill is um, this is uh, mostly known for and what is his his staple uh, of his views of his political views of his philosophical uh, philosophical views is the concept that any individual any group any uh, minority that, that uh, you know in the grander spec uh, spectrum and the grander uh, view of, of the entirety of a specific society should have the right to maintain and to to keep their beliefs and and to have those beliefs out there and have those beliefs heard no minority should be oppressed in this system. And when I say minority, I mean any minority. I mean people with views that might be considered controversial, that might be considered unconventional, that might be considered uh, down downright heretical, but all of them have the right to maintain their own uh, beliefs, to, to propagate those beliefs, but only, and this is very important, this is the one rule that that again, also is a staple of John Stewart Mill's uh, philosophy and views on liberty, that rule is that a person has the right to, to maintain their uh, personal freedom and, and to fight for their personal freedom and to reach for the goals that are important to them uh, on, on an individual level regardless of what they are, however, uh, only up until they don't affect another group or another person negatively. As long as they don't harm another individual or another group, uh, they, the, the, the people, no matter how small their group is, no matter how weird, heretical, uh, they are, no matter how wrong and bad the majority of people would consider them, they still have the right to express their beliefs and, and to keep to their beliefs mm. for as long as they don't harm anybody. Uh, and yeah, that I would say is, is the principle of, of Mill's philosophy, uh, or, or those two things are. The first one is that everybody is allowed to um, to express themselves and to uh, reach for for what Mill would consider the the truth, because every single person with their goals, what they are trying to reach in uh, Mill's mind, is 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 the truth. They are all trying to reach some some truth about the world um, in their own specific way. 
And even if that path is very clearly wrong, even if that path is very clearly uh, misguided and it's not going to lead to the truth, that person still has the right to make their own mistakes. And I think that's very important. I think that's that kind of uh, mentality, this kind of uh, point of view is, is critical. And this also kind of sh uh, shows you this like uh, dichotomy between what you know liberalism was in the eyes of Mill, the guy who kind of started the whole thing, and what is seen nowadays. Uh, I guess I still haven't talked um, fully, I haven't described uh, John Stewart's Stewart Mill philosophy uh, uh, wholly and properly here, here but uh, I think this is a good segue to jump to those three TEDx, uh, TEDx talks that I, I have mentioned. The TEDx talks that I have seen recently were, uh, despite coming from different backgrounds, from different people of all sorts of different perspectives, uh, they all had one thing in common. Uh, it is that they all were telling a story of a person who uh, came from a background that uh, was from the very beginning in conflict with, uh, with, with a group that they started involving themselves with. Uh, and despite the fact that there was clearly clashing there, despite the fact that uh, that group was, was, I would say, a minority that, that was oppressing, uh, that... that, that uh, was trying to, to oppress these individuals, that was trying to uh, maybe even harm them, they still approached them and they still let them, let those those uh, concepts be heard. Uh, those stories don't always go down the same way. They're not always as extreme as I might have uh, described them. Uh, and in one case, I'd say they it all plays itself out entirely differently. However, one thing, that one thing, uh, it, it remains, I'd say, true, is that this is a story about people approaching these controversial, outrageous, and then downright wrong uh, uh, ideologies, although not in all cases, I guess. Uh, two of these minorities would be uh, groups that, that, are, uh, that are definitely wrong because both of them are white supremacist groups. Uh, yeah, I guess I should just start saying what kind of stories I'm talking about. Uh, the three TEDx talks that I am going to discuss here are um, a, a talk by Daryl Davis about how he, as a, as a black person, uh, started attending, uh, attending KKK rallies. Uh, the story of uh, Christian, I believe it is pronounced Picciolini, uh, a, a man who, uh, a, a white man with Italian heritage who, who uh, became a white supremacist, who became um, uh, involved with, with neo-Nazi groups and then got out of them and started helping people who were still in those groups and, and helped them get out of them. Uh, and finally, it is a, a story of uh, KCJ and her story of how she, as a feminist, uh, wanted to record a documentary on the MRA, on the Men's Rights Association, and came to the conclusion that even though they were representing an entirely different point of view, there was some uh, truth to what they were saying. There was a grain of truth concealed there, which is something that is part of, of John Stewart's Mill belief system, uh, of his philosophy. Mm, yeah, essentially, uh, the reason why John Stewart Mill wanted to, uh, w wants these minorities to be heard is again, that whole concept of, of seeking truth. The fact that every single, um, every single uh, group, every single movement, every single part of our society, every single community uh, 
maybe not necessarily wants to have a mon a monopoly on the truth, but they definitely want to see themselves as uh, as as people who uh, have acquired or will acquire what is considered the the truth uh, in our, in our world, whatever that truth may be. Uh, and the reason why John Stuart Mill believes that even those people that are misguided in their search for the truth, even those people who have belief systems that are definitely wrong and are, that are definitely not something that the majority would consider, consider right, should still have the right to discuss those issues and to still talk about them. Uh, because he believes that every single movement in every single belief system, no matter how outrageous or controversial it might be, a, a grain of truth is... Uh, concealed there. Even if they are completely wrong, even if everything that they say is is just heretical in the most uh, I don't know appropriate uh, term of the word, um, even if everything that they stand for is wrong, that point of view can still help. Uh, the entire community, the entirety of our society, the entirety of our cultures put in collectively uh, reach the truth. Because what Mill also believed is that even if people, uh, the majority, uh, the people in the majority, uh, believe in something that is that that definite absolute truth, it is something that is undeniably. Uh, this this ultimate uh, truth, this ultimate realization, they should still let those people who are completely wrong in this uh, whole conversation speak. Because that way, people can still verify the validity of what they believe in. Mill believed that without a conversation happening, um, the truth that, that people believe in, no matter how right it is, no matter how true it is, is going to stagnate and is going to lose its, um, its validity to people. They're, they're going to accept this as like this blatant truth and because of this they're not really going to acknowledge it for what it is. They're not going to look at it as a truth, that truth will be stagnated. A truth will be something that, that they will just look at and take for granted. They will not try to question it. They will not try to verify it in any kind of way. And that's why the conversation has to happen. That's why the other side, that minority that that's, gives you all of these outrageous claims, should have the right to still uh, say things. Because even if they are entirely wrong, uh, they can still help you verify the truth. And this is, I guess we'll start, even though she was mentioned last, with KCJ. This is kind of what happened in, in her case um uh, though also not entirely but i think she is like the most obvious example here uh so long story short uh kcj again as i have mentioned was it was a feminist who tried to um to to create a documentary a documentary on the men's rights association and essentially showing people how ridiculous that movement is how uh horribly misogynistic and then uh, antagonizing towards uh, women's uh, you know movement for their rights and their uh, equality uh, is mm. and her documentary uh, uh, look. <laughs> yeah, her documentary is essentially uh, or what was essentially uh, her uh, approaching, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but a lot of, of, of members of the MRA and, and discussing uh, their, their movement with her. Uh, she was questioning them and, and she was trying to like get a lot of answers out of them. And the way she described it is that when she was listening to them, she wasn't really listening to them but trying to but rather trying to catch uh, certain comments from them that would confirm to her her beliefs uh, that, that her beliefs are right which kind of sounds like what mill was uh, saying but, but yeah the, the, the thing about kcj is that uh, she approached those uh, those those uh, people that, that those members of the MRA 
expecting them to be wrong. And what she got out of it was uh, uh, her coming to a realization that, in fact, she was in a lot of cases wrong. Not in uh, the, the issues and problems that, that feminism tries to fight against. Not in the way those issues were still... Uh, not, not in the fact that those issues were somehow not relevant anymore because they were still relevant and they were still very important to her but she started to notice that, that the things that she accused the MRA of were not wholeheartedly true there was still some truth to the misogyny that, that she saw in the movement she, there were still a lot of uh, men in that, that association that were uh, downright misogynistic and I, that, that were <laughs> saying some, some uh, awfully wrong things however there were a lot of men in that movement that were also saying things that uh, were presenting a case that that uh, that, 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 um, that KCJ uh, wasn't really taken into consideration before. They were telling her that there were issues that men faced as well. Uh, for example, child custody issues, uh, an increased suicide rate uh, when compared to like the, the amount of suicide, like, like successful suicide attempts uh, uh, when compared to females. And uh, KCJ, when she saw those, uh, when, when she listened to these people, her immediate thought was to just confront them, to just say, no, this is uh, wrong, you're trying to uh, show me that what I am standing for is not right. And in reality, that's not what they were actually saying uh, because when uh, KCJ was then reviewing those those uh, recordings that she, she made and she started to listen to them while also trying to recall from what I remember she also was uh, video blogging herself um, she was creating like this video diary uh, to, to kind of uh, uh, add this like commentary to the interviews that she was conducting and when she was comparing these two, uh, these two uh, parallel recordings that she was making, uh, she came to the conclusion that, yeah, like what these people were saying wasn't actually as bad as she was making it out to be. What she thought in, uh, after those interviews or in that moment was just her adding um, poison to, to uh, what these people were saying. In some cases, it was justified, but in some cases, she was just... Uh, kind of tapping into her own narrative as opposed to uh, as opposed to uh, you know just just listening to the other side and what came out from that experience was her uh, then uh, realizing that you know men's rights issues are real and that what she from that point on wants to fight for is both sides that she just doesn't want to be a feminist she also wants to to help men with the issues that they also face and that are universal to males uh, and the reason why i think that story is interesting in uh in regards to our um, conversation about male is that it shows that uh, it shows that part of, of, of Mill's stance about seeking truth that it, I think resonates with this story really well. Uh, because Casey was um, seeing this this minority group because, you know, I, I would consider the MRA to be like this uh, group that isn't really part of like the mainstream conversation. But then she realized that perhaps uh, at least a good majority of them should be part of that conversation. Those that are uh, that are actually concerned with uh, the problems of men's rights and not uh, with uh, being a bunch of misogynistic assholes. Uh, what KCJ um, got out of that was 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 the truth. The truth that was concealed in that minority group that she approached, not really searching for that truth, uh, but but what she got out of this. And this is not uh, a, a 
an issue of self-actualization here. Uh, to some extent it is. I, I would not say that this is her coming to a, a, a group that is wholeheartedly wrong, that is entirely wrong, and that uh, stands for everything that that's, has no actual merit in regards to, to truth. Uh, this is her coming to a, a group that she thought was something like this, but then finding out that in reality they how like this second half of the truth that she was seeking, you know, uh, if you were to kind of look at it from, from this mill perspective. Uh, to me, it is interesting because, again, it, in, in, in the current climate, in the current social climate, uh, this kind of conversation is rare. And again, uh, if we were to look at the classical depiction of liberalism in, in John Stuart Mill, this is something that was encouraged. This is something that was supposed to happen. These kinds of conversations uh, in, in Mill's idea uh, were supposed to be the, the uh, reality. However, I said that this was supposed to be a conversation. This is not necessarily the case. What Mill was advocating for was to just have those uh, what was just the right for all groups, regardless of how uh, major or minor they are, to have uh, a, a platform to speak on, to have a platform to talk about issues that they are um, they they are they are standing for, they they stand for. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that a conversation has to take place. Sometimes it's just a matter of listening, which is what uh, I think uh, happened in the case of Daryl Davis. Uh, and this is a very interesting case. This is a very curious case. We're going to go back to, to, uh, to, to Miss J, um, uh, I think. But for now, let's just jump to, uh, to the next TEDx. Uh, uh, the, the case of, of Daryl Davis and, and him uh, attending uh, KKK rallies despite being a black person. You know, the, the very uh, paragon of what uh, that group, the KKK, is, is trying to f fight against because they, they despise it, they, they hate it, they think it's like this uh, horrible uh, <laughs> plague spread uh, all over the U.S., uh, yeah, so it, it, it doesn't really look all that uh, colorful when, uh, and, and happy and uh, positive when, when uh, in this particular case. Uh, the, the history of Daryl Davis, in, in, uh, mm, like depicted in a very short synopsis, is that he, uh, as a very young boy, uh, was uh, exposed to, to racism during a, I think it was like a parade or something. He was uh, in Boy Scouts and he was um, uh, taking part in this, this uh, event in his town. Uh, and some people, uh, while he was carrying a, a banner or something like that, started just throwing things at him, some, some cans, some bottles, uh, calling him names. Uh, I think, uh, and, and and essentially, like yeah, he was shocked that someone could uh, act like this towards him. He had no idea why these people were just uh, all of a sudden harassing him, attacking him, him as a, as as like a very young boy, maybe like eight or nine. I don't remember, but he was very young, uh, and these people were attacking him. Uh, these grown people, like throwing things at a little boy. Uh, and he was shocked uh, as to why that would be the case. And when he asked people that were protecting him during this rally, who kind of like uh, created this barrier between him and the people that were antagonizing him, uh, he asked them like what was going on, why he was attacked, and people said that it was because of his skin color. And, and that, according to him, kind of started this uh, whole uh, journey uh, into uh, the conversation regarding racism and hate in general. Uh, there's this uh, hate that, that has no uh, 
base technically aside from just the way someone is born with, with a specific skin pigment or in a specific culture or environment uh something that we don't really have a a choice about um and yeah he started to venture into it asking himself why someone would hate somebody that they have no uh knowledge of that they don't know who that person is really uh and doing it only because they they look a certain way uh and yeah long story short he was uh researching that he was reading some books he was uh writing some books you know he was trying to delve deep into the matter of of racism and, and this uh uh let's just say unsolicited uh hatred and in the course of that research, he decided that he was to contact a, a member of the KKK. And not just any member, uh, one of the leaders of the KKK. Uh, I believe his name was Kelly Roger. Uh, uh, I don't remember the ranks in, uh, in, in the KKK. I think at some point he did become a, a Grand Wizard, though. Mm. Uh, but regardless of that, for now, let's just, uh, d d you know, uh, focus on, on his interactions with, uh, with Daryl Davis. Long story short, because, uh, you know, if you want to uh, check out the full story, which is very fascinating and, and very uh, interesting, uh, I'd say, uh, you can just go check out Daryl Davis um, and his TEDx talk uh, on YouTube. Uh, but yeah. Uh, what what happened is that over uh, after the first uh, time that that Daryl Davis managed to contact Roger Kelly and set up an interview with him, and after their first interaction, which was kind of intense at times, Daryl Davis claimed that that he uh, he was warned that that he could die uh, that night when he was uh, going to conduct the interview with Roger, Roger Kelly. Because, you know, he was a member of the KKK. Um, yeah, he was fully aware of that. And the interview was at times intense. But uh, what happened during that interview was that... Uh, um, essentially, uh, the story went that, that uh, while they were conducting this interview... Uh, a, a strange noise, uh, noise occurred uh, that they heard and it sounded like a gunshot or, or something of that uh, uh, of that kind you know this, the dangerous kind and uh, both gentlemen jumped immediately to a conclusion that uh, one of them tried to do something funny tried to do something not haha funny but the other kind of funny what the noise turned out to be was just ice uh, in, in a uh, cooler uh, popping. And both, uh, and essentially, after that like interview uh, went back to normal, and the two gentlemen realized that they kind of jumped to conclusions about the other person without actually having any good uh, reasons to, uh, to assume that, that something was going to happen right? like that. You know, uh, some may argue that there were good reasons, but uh, that doesn't matter right now. I'd say what what matters is that yeah, like uh, what they the two of them realized was that uh, yeah, like they were jumping to conclusions a little bit too quickly. And long story short, after that first interview, uh, Daryl Davis managed to contact Roger Kelly uh, a couple more times. They started. Uh, uh, talking regularly they started to interact with each other regularly and at the end of the day uh they became this like weird uh form of of friends you know like the two of them became like like these good acquaintances at the very least uh, i'd say friends and uh daryl davis started attending kkk rallies and you know he uh went there uh, invited by Roger Kelly 
he was listening to their uh, speeches during the rallies. He was looking and observing and taking all of it in, taking all that experience. And after those rallies, he would converse with members of the KKK. And in a lot of cases, as was the case with, with Roger, Roger Kelly, he managed to talk them out of uh, the KKK. He managed to, uh, you know, for just a simple conversation, for a simple discussion, and from simply being there and giving them perspective into this world that they were constantly shunning away and they were trying to isolate themselves from because of how they were uh, indoctrinated by uh, their peers or, uh, you know, through various different circumstances. This is something that we might jump into when we get into the final TED Talk. Uh, but essentially, what did I want to get out of this? Uh, is that uh, the case of Daryl Davis is fascinating because of how, uh, well, first and foremost, because of how radical this this uh, <laughs> uh, this guy with these fucking balls of steel and, and how radical his decision was to just go to these like people that were known for hating. Uh, the the minority that he was representing so much that they would actually like you know historically hang them uh, and and uh, like violently uh, oppress them. Uh, it's, it's so yeah like that in itself is quite fascinating. But then what is fascinating is that despite that he still managed to strike up a conversation with them. He still managed to listen to them, and and that was. Uh, enough to to start a discussion, to to get these people to accept him, in whatever way or fashion it might happen between you know a, a white supremacist and a, a KKK movement and a, a black uh, R and B musician. Uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's crazy, but uh, but that shows you something. That that shows you that. A conversation can happen, in, in, in at least that's what I would believe. That's what I uh, take out of this. Uh, I believe that's also what Daryl Davis uh, is, is, is a kind of propagating, is that any group uh, should uh, have a platform uh, where they can stand and where they can be heard, because then that provides that group with the ability of being confronted and then allows the other groups that may be, uh, you know, against that group or may just stand for uh, opposing beliefs to, to also approach this group and also have a conversation. And then it is beneficial for both sides because one side, the wrong side, uh, because I, I don't think any rational person would advocate for uh, you know the the issues of the, that that KKK is representing. Um, yeah, uh, it provides one side with, with the ability to put their belief system in perspective, and the other side to put things in perspective and kind of learn from the mistakes that the other side is making. And what Daryl Davis shows is that all it takes is listening. It takes courage because what he did is obviously fucking courageous. But um, it's also something that, uh, that that seems simple, you know. It, it seems like something that, that doesn't really require much. It just requires you to be open-minded, which can be hard. But the sole, uh, the, the, the sole decision in, in terms of its execution is, is very simple. It's to just stay open to... Uh, the fact that there might be someone out there who believes in something completely different than you believe in and just giving them a, a chance to explain themselves. Just give them a chance to be heard, just give them a chance to show their belief system because that opens uh, a platform for both sides to have a conversation about it. And a conversation is far better than, than simply shunning something away. At least that's what I would believe and that's what uh, John Stuart Mill uh, also represented. John Stuart Mill wanted a conversation to happen. John Stuart Mill wanted every single individual to have the right to pursue their own goals, pursue their own uh, vision of truth, because he believed that that would spark uh, something that would benefit everybody. 
the entirety of, of, of communities, of societies, of, of whatever that is like a collective system of, of existence. Let's just call it that. Um, and that is fascinating about uh, the case of Darrell Davis, is, is that he, for simple conversation, which, which seems outrageous, but when you think about it, it doesn't really have to be. It, it is something that, that makes sense. Uh, for simple conversation with these people, he was able to very quickly show them the errors in their way of thinking. Uh, very, he was very quickly showing them like this bias and this uh, system of beliefs that was simply indoctrinating, uh, indoctrinating in them. And even if they weren't treating him as as a peer, because that was never the case, at least not until you know they got out of of, uh, of the KKK, uh, they were still letting him be there to listen to them and he uh, wasn't taking it for granted he was approaching it and saying yes i want to listen to you i want to see what you are standing for and that i believe is is, is very important is for us to just acknowledge that as, and to and to talk about it uh, whatever it might be no matter how controversial no matter how radical uh, of course there is a marriage into it if, because if these KKK members were actively threatening him, that's when the conversation kind of has to stop, right? If they are threatening him in the sense that they would actively seek to harm him, uh, that's when, and that is also according to John Stuart Mill, uh, when you kind of have to draw the line. That line is very fascinating, and I, and I will talk about it soon. But I'm, I already see how much time has passed and fucking terrifies me. <laughs> I thought I would be done with this in 20 minutes, but I guess I just uh, kind of rolled myself into, into a longer conversation. I'll think about making this whole thing a little bit more concise in the future or, or how to make it. But anyways, we have one last story before uh, coming to a conclusion to, to all of this. And it's the, the story of, of Christian, uh, again, I don't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but uh, Picciolini, I believe. Uh, a man who, at a very young age, uh, became involved with, with white supremacist groups, who became a, a neo-Nazi and who became a very active member in that uh, community to the point where he became a, a leader of, of one uh, such group and who eventually after uh, years of, of being involved with that movement started to see errors in his way of thinking and, and, the, and errors in the uh, issues that that the group was standing for and eventually got out of it and then after that he started to help people who were in a similar situation to him and I believe he still does it to this day mm. he uh, helped them see th the same errors and help them get out of, of that uh, group, of that radical, uh, controversial, rightfully so group. Uh, so long story short, again, <laughs> all of them are, are long and short at the same time. Uh, yeah, uh, Christian was uh, at the age of, of, I believe, 13 or 14, uh, approached by a, a white supremacist uh, while he was kind of acting out because he came from a very poor family, uh, as I recall it, uh, from a family that, that was... Uh, that, uh, the, his parents were Italian immigrants and they uh, were struggling to kind of make a living in the US. Uh, and despite the fact that they loved Christian, he was... Uh, he, you know, they didn't really spend much time with him and he felt left out. He felt kind of like lonely and isolated and he didn't know what to do with himself. So he then, at the age of like 13 or 14, started acting out and uh, while being a little delinquent, one day he was approached by, by a white supremacist and uh, that's kind of where his whole adventure with that movement started. Uh, he became very involved with it, uh, he started writing songs uh, that were, uh, you know, uh, hateful and then racist and propagating white supremacist ideas. And eventually he became a leader 
uh, of, of those groups. But then it all changed when he became married to, to a girl uh, that he met at the age of 19, I believe. Uh, and they started having kids and he realized that he, uh, the, the ideas that he stands for no longer correlate with his life. All of a sudden, his life had a different purpose. It had a, it had a different meaning. He, it had that connection with people that he was looking for this entire time. Um, and the ideals that he was associating himself with before because of... Uh, like out of this like lack of, of any uh, ideals and purpose to, to begin with, uh, those started to uh, seem less valid to him. They started to seem less like what truly represented him. And uh, after that, he decided to like lay low. He still didn't uh, get out of the movement, despite the fact that his wife, if I do remember cor correctly, kind of wanted him to. Uh, they had a kid, uh, he, uh, and this also influenced, influenced his point of view. Uh, eventually, like, yeah, he wanted to lay low and uh, instead of going out into the streets and committing all of those heinous acts that he was accusing other uh, groups, minorities, uh, different communities uh, of doing, uh, despite the fact that he was doing it himself, for example, you know, smuggling drugs, uh, other form of contraband into cities, and uh, getting involved in all of this criminal activity that he was, for example, accusing uh, black communities of. Uh, yeah, he essentially decided to stray away from that, and uh, you know, while still getting involved with, it, with the movement, open up a music shop and start selling. Uh, start selling white supremacist music like uh, Diwan's uh, like, like the kinds of songs that he was making uh, in that shop but because he couldn't uh, from what I recall uh, sell that music uh, regularly uh, without stirring up some controversy in the community that would most likely shut down his shop he had to sell also some other form of music so for example metal punk uh, hip-hop and uh, long story short <laughs> uh, in that music shop despite the fact that the revenue of this shop was I believe in 75% uh, of the income that he was gaining from that shop was from selling this, this white supremacist music because he, he kind of had like this monopoly on it and people from all over the, the states would uh, come buy music from him uh, he also had other clients that were buying this like you know regular music that was just kind of this facade that he was putting up for the community and interacting with these people listening to them hearing them out and, and, and just like kind of seeing things in them that resonated with him uh, as a person that resonated with his character and his life's ex experiences for example he had this moment if i do rec uh, remember correctly when uh a young uh, black kid like uh, came to his shop and, and uh, looked kind of moody. So the uh, so Christian asked him what uh, was the problem, and he told him that uh, his mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and Christian's mom was also diagnosed with breast cancer, and that kind of helped him connect with that kid, with this random uh, kid that just like showed up in his shop and. That technically represented what uh, he in, in his group was uh, opposing with, with full force. And after a couple of uh, similar experiences, Christian came to the conclusion that uh, that movement is no longer what he uh, can associate himself with. He started seeing that none of these things that, that were representing his person, that were this like staple of his person for all these years, that those aren't really his ideas, these aren't really his... Uh, 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 these aren't really aspects of his own identity. This is something that he superimposed upon himself in order to belong. And after realizing this, after confronting the, the uh, other groups, he... Um, you know, these minorities that he was opposing, these communities that he was uh, opposing. Um, yeah, he, he got out of the movement, uh, taking some heavy losses in the process because he did it, uh, from what I uh, remember, a little bit too late. Uh, uh, you know, 
though he he his marriage marriage struggled because of that there were some issues there but he got out, got out of the movement and he decided that yeah seeing those mistakes that he has he has made seeing that those issues that roped him into uh, the these white supremacist groups uh, he decided to help kids uh, with similar issues um uh, that were also being uh, attracted to joining those movements, and this is where that that issue that uh, I I'd say can be traced uh, to to or can be kind of uh, that, that has this like connection with with what Mill is saying uh, happens. It's the fact that, uh, but also the the everything prior to that is also part of that that conversation, which is why I'm uh, describing it. But but essentially, yeah, after that, he started approaching kids who who were in a similar a similar situation to him, uh, people in general that that were also part of these white supremacist groups and that were spiteful and hateful for towards uh, other people for for no good reason other than, you know, the fact that this was kind of just uh, imposed upon them. Uh, he started approaching them and showing them this alt uh, alternative perspective. And again, even though he no longer saw what he was standing for as right, he uh, despised it. He f saw that it was wrong and, and, and he couldn't bear the thought that this could still be a thing, uh, at the very least in his life. But I believe, you know, this could be uh, spread upon like just, just this world in general. He still decided to treat uh, treat these individuals with empathy, to, to still see the same wrongs that he uh, that, that got him into the situation in the fir uh, first place in their particular situation, and helping them see uh, the the errors in his in, in their way of thinking, and in his past way of thinking, and helping them confront uh, these these uh, wrongful visions of the world. Uh, with, uh, with the alternative perspective that these people were just completely isolating themselves from. So again, Christian worked as like this uh, bridge between two sides so that they can start having a conversation. So that they might start having uh, a, a, a serious talk about what they believed in uh, in, in order to verify uh, what they considered their own individual truths. Uh, yes. And the case of Christian in this particular conversation, in the light of, of uh, John Stuart Mill's uh, liberalism and his vision on, on individual freedoms uh, and, and social liberty, uh, I think in the light of that, it is interesting because it shows you that uh, part, that aspect of the minority that is completely in their own. Not the minority that actually is right against the rest of the world, but the minority that is clearly on the right side of, of, of history. Uh, and how the fact that the conversation can happen can also help them get out of that situation. The fact that they have a platform to be heard, or at least a platform where they can confront their issues with the rest of the world, helps them see uh, the, the wrongdoings of their own and helps them see errors in their way of thinking. Without that experience that Christian would have with uh, all of those members of these minorities and communities that he was spiteful towards, uh, for example, like that, that black kid or a homosexual couple that came to his uh, shop with their kid. Um, yeah, all of that helped him see that uh, he was in, in the wrong, that what he believed in was wrong and then that uh, he should probably change the way he was looking at things. Uh, first and foremost, it was his confrontation with his wife uh, with, with his uh, lover who was against him uh, you know a, a, as a white supremacist who, who didn't want him to stay in that group and then after that there was the confrontation with the groups that that he would otherwise just completely isolate himself from because that's kind of what the uh, minority group that he was a part of um, would, would, would want him to do they would want him to just completely segregate himself from from these people, or just just commit full segregation, technically. 
Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it is curious because, it, again, it shows you that the conversation is beneficial for, for both sides and both sides benefit from it. One side can verify the their own truth, their their own uh, you know right uh, rightfulness, uh, their own claims through this uh, perspective of the minority that might be in the wrong completely, and and the minority that's in the wrong still benefits and and also. Uh, <laughs> like reaches the truth because they start to see what they believe in something that they uh, that was indoctrinated upon them uh, and, and that's something that they would in no other way be able to verify uh, if that platform wasn't there for them if, if there wasn't that bridge connecting them to that other side and, and, and if they weren't heard by that other side if the other side didn't allow them to discuss those issues, like the kids that then uh, were taken by Christian. For example, he, in his TEDx talk, mentioned uh, this this man that uh, he was conversing with online and uh, who was very spiteful towards... Uh, who, who completely despised uh, Muslim pe people. And Christian set up a conversation between him and, a, and an imam. And after that conversation... Uh, that man uh, like <laughs> left the white supremacist group that he was a part of. He, he changed his views because simply because he was able to be heard by that imam, simply because he had uh, a, an opportunity provided by Christian to see the other side. And the fact that the other side was there to listen to him helped him change his ways. And, and yeah, uh, <laughs> To jump to a conclusion here real quick, uh, because this has gone on for way, way longer than I had anticipated. Um, what I wanted to get out of this, uh, this whole conversation is kind of like this highlight of what I believe makes Mill a worthy uh, philosopher to consider when talking about liberalism. And, and talking about uh, individual freedoms uh, and, uh, you know, the case of freedom of speech, which is a, a very heated and, and hot debate right now. This is what's hot and trendy uh, in the world at the moment. Uh, yeah, what I believe um, is uh, makes Mill so relevant now is the fact that he shows you what... Uh, liberalism kind of started off as that, that it started off not as this uh, fight, this, this uh, antagonization of, of the other side, but rather it wanted to allow all sides to just come together and, and uh, even if they didn't see eye to eye, or especially if they didn't see eye to eye uh, you know he wanted to allow all of those sides to still have a conversation with each other because that way, the truth can be verified, the truth can be confirmed, the truth can be um, cemented into everyone, uh, everyone's minds without being, you know, stagnated, without being this, this thing that we just take for granted, without really thinking about it. Uh, that truth then becomes this, like, barren truth. Uh, and yeah, in this case, the truth can be verified, the truth can, you know, uh, get updated, let's just say. Uh, and confirmed and, and become this like fresh new thing for people once again while the bad stuff can also be verified and seen as something that is wrong and that is why i believe that that the current reality the current state of of, of our conversations in in this political sphere is all over the place and it is in no way the same thing that that john stuart mill stood for uh <laughs> I also wanted to talk about issues of, of uh, hate speech and freedom of speech in regards to uh, Mill's uh, philosophy. And I wanted to talk about how uh, that drawing that line uh, 
this is like point to which a conversation should be allowed is kind of arbitrary and weird and then how it's not always crystal clear as to where that line should be drawn especially in the current day and age but i don't have the time for that so i just want to real quick uh, just just finish this, this whole long talk on uh, uh on this this statement this conclusion that uh, what the current uh, world misses, what the current day and age, and all of its conversation, all uh, conversations, all of its debates, and all of its uh, confrontations between two sides, is the ability to listen, to listen to the other side, not listen in in the sense that that you just try to catch every single wrong detail in in what they are saying. Not listen in the sense that you immediately uh, become indoctrinated by that other side. You immediately take everything that they say for granted. Uh, so, for example, you know, uh, listening for uh, the the errors in the other people's way of thinking uh, and doing only that deliberately would be what uh, KC, KCJ was doing. Uh, listening and immediately being indoctrinated by it would be something that you know Christian and other young uh, impressionable boys uh, and girls I guess uh, kind of get roped into uh, because they see no purpose in their life uh, yeah listening in the way Daryl Davis tried to do that listening while seeing that the other side is wrong but still giving them a chance to explain themselves still giving them a chance to talk about what they are doing and then try to maintain a conversation with them because that way that conversation is beneficial for both sides that conversation allows the truth to come out whatever it might be uh, and it helps those that are in the wrong see the errors of their ways without being antagonized the last thing people want to be is be antagonized that's why we, for example, hate white supremacist groups so much. It's because they antagonize people for no good reason, uh, other than some bias. Mm. Yeah. It, uh, the one thing that I wanted to take out of this conversation, this, this belief that I have personally, is that uh, it is hard, and it may not seem like the most optimal way of solving things, but listening to the other side is important. And that's kind of why I wanted to have these conversations in the first place. That's why I encourage you people to, then, to after watching this really long, stupid thing that I recorded for no fucking reason, uh, other than I'm bored and I kind of really wanted to talk to people. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's that, the that second part. I, I wanted to talk to people. I want to converse with people. And even though we may not see eye to eye, I still want to talk with you. I still want to discuss things with you and this is why I thought that that John Stuart Mill talk would be interesting to take on first because that kind of sets up you know a conversation for us uh, it's a conversation about conversation uh, kind of cute uh, I don't really know how to wrap up this video uh, I don't really know uh, uh, what else to say I think in terms of my own stance here after this long, long talk is that uh, I would encourage people to converse. I would encourage people to put their opinions out there, but also when they receive an opinion that is completely outrageous to them and is completely wrong and is completely, you know, this like SJW bullshit, this alt-right bullshit, like don't immediately shun them away, listen to them. Even if they are sounding like, like an indoctrinated fanatic, still listen to them. Because that way, you're going to you know, help yourself verify uh, what you believe in. And maybe even if you then engage in a conversation with that person, help them see the errors of their ways. That way is way more efficient than simply saying, them, uh, saying to them that, Ooh, you are in the wrong. Because if you, are do if, if you do that, that immediately antagonizes those people. And it antagonizes you in their eyes. They already see you as an enemy. And if they see you as an enemy, they're not going to listen to you like, uh, like your peer. You're going to be an adversary to them. Uh, and that immediately antagonizes them to all of the views that you're representing. Try listening to them while also giving some something of your own. Not in a... Uh, 
in an, uh, I'd say, I don't want to keep using this word because it's going to sound redundant, but yeah, not, not in an antagonizing way, but in a way that creates a nice and, and simple platform for people to start a debate, for people to start a conversation. And that is where I'm going to stop this recording. And uh, yeah, if you have something to add to this, if you want to have a conversation with me afterwards, I strongly encourage you to then post this uh, any uh, arguments that you might have, any points that you might have uh, in the comments below. I can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's what, what I want you to do. Uh, if you want to correct me on some things, because I do believe that I might have uh, said some things about Mill uh, wrongly, I think, you know, term uh, terminology-wise at, at the release, I, I think I caught myself uh, saying some things that, uh, saying some words that don't necessarily, uh, <laughs> that the R and D words that are used for these like specific ideas in Mill's philosophy. But anyways, yeah, if, if you want to correct me on something, feel free to do that. If you want to extend the conversation, I strongly encourage you to do that. Maybe I'll uh, set up some Twitter stuff. I don't, I don't really know yet. I, I have nothing set up. I'm just recording this right now. But yeah, I'm looking forward to talking with you people and uh, maybe in the nearest future I'll make another video. Until then, thank you for listening. I hope this was, at the very least, a nice background noise to put on. This is, again, this like weird kind of like podcasty kind of thing. And I'll uh, see you around. Kamikaze Jones, uh, out. <laughs>